working drummer. Now kick it. This is the Working Drummer Podcast, serving up perspectives, experiences, and stories from ground-level working pros. Advice, tips, and secrets on how to build a career in the music business. Hey everybody, welcome to Working Drummer Podcast. This is Zach Albetta, and today's interview is with Todd Strait. Todd has been a jazzer since third grade, and since then has made his way from his hometown of Topeka, Kansas, to New York, to Kansas City, to Portland, Oregon. His mentors as a young drummer were Ed Sof and Joe Morello, and he was barely in his 20s when he landed the drum chair in the trio led by one of the most revered jazz pianists in history, Marion McPartland. From there, he went on to play with the Woody Herman Band, Barney Kessel, Kevin Mahogany, and Eldar. Todd is best known for his long tenure in the band of five-time Grammy-nominated vocalist Karin Allison. This episode is sponsored by Sakai Drums. You know the Sakai sound, now get to know the Sakai name. Trusted around the world for almost 100 years, Sakai's devotion to craftsmanship and passion in creating the world's best quality drums is unmatched. Handcrafted in Osaka, Japan, Sakai offers the most versatile drums from the Trilogy Vintage Series to the modern almighty Japanese Birch Recording Kit, each boasting a distinct sound and feel. Go to SakaiDrums.com to learn why studio legend Eddie Bayers, the Smashing Pumpkins' Jimmy Chamberlain, and Tedeschi Trucks Band's J.J. Johnson and Tyler Greenwell choose Sakai. Elevate your sound with Sakai. That website, again, is S-A-K-A-E-Drums.com. So let's get to it with Todd Strait. We had a great conversation about jazz and jazz history and about the musical and geographic turns his path has taken over the years. Hope you enjoy it. See you on the other side. You grew up in Topeka, Kansas. Correct. Um, yes. And and your father was a musician. He was a musician on the weekends. He actually had a nine to five job during the week. A weekend warrior. A weekend warrior. What did he play? Right. Piano. Okay. Played piano. He sang. Played a little bit of uh, bass and trombone. Mm-hmm. And actually, he he started uh, playing music in in when he was in college. And they, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a group called the Four Freshmen. Yeah. Yeah, so he was in a group uh, that was basically a four freshman copy group. Huh. So what they did was, I've actually got a tape of one of their rehearsals. It's a little cassette tape, and it's all you know, scratchy and stuff. But you know what they're doing is they're listening to each phrase and trying to pick out the notes. Wow! Because nobody read music, <laughs> so, they, so they just it was. I can't imagine how long it took them to get this stuff together but they actually did put out one record uh uh and i have that as well wow so but yeah they sounded great you know and what was his day job his day job he worked for the kansas state department of education okay cool so totally opposite end of the scale right right and somebody somebody told me a story it might have been sam wiseman that told me this that like at, at some point in your childhood or like your high school career you had you had a whole summer and you were just like i'm going to practice this whole summer so you you treated practicing the way your dad had his job it was like you treated right. practicing as a nine to five thing is that true it, that's very true it was yeah nine to question mark right because- I actually, at the beginning of the summer, I thought, I think I'd heard an interview or read something in Modern Drummer about a drummer who had planned their practice schedule. Uh-huh. And like, you know, it was, a, it was an assignment. Mm-hmm. And so what I did was I, uh, at the beginning of the summer, wrote out on a sheet of paper, you know, from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., I'm going to practice stick control. And then from 9.15 to 10.30, I'm going to work on my rolls at different volume, you know, different dynamics or what it's just blah, blah, blah. Right. And so I I had it written out to where I would do the kind of the taxing stuff first Mm -hmm. and then leave the fun stuff for the very end. Like, you know, play solo, don't worry how it sounds, just, you know, exercise. Right, And then play along with records was the very last thing. But I (laughs) waited till the end of the day to do that because that's the most fun. Right. And if I did that first, I wouldn't feel like working on coordination and technique. It'd be like, hey, I'll just do that tomorrow. Right, right. So I actually, I did the hard part first and then, and yeah, I did it all summer, every and single day. How old were you? That was in, uh, I guess, I was probably a junior in high school. Wow. I forget if it's the summer before that or after. But uh, we lived kind of in the country north of Topeka. Mm-hmm. And it was just my dad and I and uh, no neighbors. And my dad, man, was a trooper. <laughs> because uh, I'd get done, like I'd be playing along with Buddy Rich's, you know, stuff, you know, yeah. 
one thirty, two in the morning, slamming away <laughs> headphones, you know, and I get done all sweaty, you know, and just, yeah. you know, really, tr- you know, trying to work it up that way. I get done, take the headphones off, and, and I hear from the other room. Oh, my God. I mean, my deep through it, you know. Oh, wow. So, I always thought that was cool, and then later I thought, yeah, maybe that was just a commentary on... <laughs> right. Oh, I seen it was. <laughs> yeah. You're you're not exciting me here. You're, <laughs> uh, you're putting me to sleep. <laughs> right, right. Oh, that's great. Um so ja- like f- for you it was it was jazz from an early age, right? Absolutely. What why is that? How did why why didn't you get turned on by by metal or or you know any of the other stuff that was part of your generation? Well, you know, I can. I'll, I'll refer the, back to the four freshmen again. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, I was in third grade and I and I got sick with something, so I was home for a week. And by the you know second or third day, I was so bored that I you know was just ready to to do anything. And my dad had these little forty fives of the four freshmen, mm-hmm. and there was one that had Poinciana on one side and Day by Day on the other. Mm-hmm. So those are the two tunes that they uh, were known for, among many others. So I listened to this record, and there was something about uh, my, f- you know, f- that I was sick or tired or bored or whatever it was. I really heard some stuff that I thought was just super cool, mm-hmm. like the harmonies, you know, and just the the sound of that group. Yeah. So at that point, I'm like, yeah, this is. <laughs> Great, and I and I never really listened to the radio anyway. Yeah, at that age, but I started listening to my dad's forty fives of the Four Freshmen, mm-hmm. which then led me to the Stan Kenton Big Band. Right, they did a lot of things in collaboration, and then of course, you know the drums. And by that time, I, you know, I had a Buddy Rich record or whatever, and you know, I just kind of yeah. started to from there. So it came from that, hmm. not not in third grade, but third grade is as early as I remember hearing something that I thought. Wow, I really hear this. I really love this. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's a, that's amazing to like because mo- you know, I, I think I had a similar experience to most people where I I fell in love with the drums first. You know, mm-hmm. playing along with the Beatles or Guns N' Roses or whoever it was, and then and then you know later in high school and into college is where jazz kind of took hold. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, from the third grade, you were a you were a jazzer. Well, that's when I started really hearing that as my preferred music. Yeah. And then it was really wasn't until probably middle school, like seventh grade, mm-hmm. when uh, I completely got into it. Yeah. And, and who, who did you start listening to at that point? It was still uh, uh, somebody, but more uh, Clifford Brown, Max Roach yeah, stuff. Yeah. And uh, just Clifford Brown's sound just totally floored me. Mm-hmm. You know, just that beautiful, dark, warm, just gorgeous sounds right and at that time i was i, I was actually playing trumpet mostly I, really? I wasn't really considering being a drummer i wanted to be a trumpet player wow. and uh yeah and then i got braces and like i've told my my daughter uh you know back then like they didn't have the wax covered i know braces are painful now right but back then they just basically used barbed wire right you know what I, mean? <laughs> I mean that's what it was and so i mean i couldn't play trumpet i just my mouth bled every time oh man so i'm like well there's a drum set over there you know and that's how i started playing drums was wow. because i played trumpet yeah so it it sounds like kind of your you know the first two drummers in your head are are buddy rich and max roach yeah um and that like that was a, the case for me as well when i started listening to jazz and playing for jazz, playing jazz like i very quickly recognized those two guys as kind of the opposite ends of the spectrum jazz drumming wise so how like how did you absorb those two those two very different influences as a young player? Well, I mean, Buddy was attractive to me at first because his you know his incredible technique mm-hmm. and you know just the his groove. But I, you know, I heard uh, the music in Max's playing, and you know, of course, with Clifford Brown being there too. But you know, through Max, then you know, I became aware of Philly Joe and got more into the bebop drummers and. Right. You know, so I spent a little bit of time in the swing world, you know, mm. with Buddy and Louis Belson, I should say, was, was another huge influence. Right. Because I heard more musical approaches from him, I guess, mm-hmm. you know, that, that resonated with me anyway. Right. So actually, I would say Louis was more of an yeah. uh, influence than Buddy was for mm. me. But Buddy was the first drummer, yeah. you know, that I, that I noticed. And then Max, like you said, you know, Philly Joe, a uh, uh, little bit of Kenny Clark. I'm, I'm still 
listening to stuff, you know, now uh, from these guys from the bebop era. Right. And uh, I think that's really kind of where my heart is. In it's the, somewhere between the swing era and the bebop era. Yeah. And, yeah. and I love the cats like Steve Gadd and, and Dave Weckl and, you know, uh, you know that end too. But uh, mm-hmm. I think, you know, I really pay a t- lot of attention when it's more bebop oriented stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's something I notice about your playing is is that you you never you never go too far outside. You know, yeah. your your playing is always interesting and creative, but it it never ventures kind of you you don't really color outside the lines. Uh not much. Yeah, not yeah. too much. And so it it makes sense that that you know, when you when you talk about Louis being uh, one of your one of your major influences, that's that makes a lot of sense. You studied uh, with Ed Sof in college, correct? Yes, sir. And so that was that was Ed Sof's pre North Texas years. Correct. This and, is in 1980. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's I, I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna make you feel bad, but that's the year I was born. So. Uh, that's okay. I felt worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's that was at a school in New Jersey, right? It was in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Bridgeport, Connecticut. What school yeah. was that? It's the University of Bridgeport. Okay. And when I showed up there, I, I had met Ed uh, when he was through Topeka with Clark Terry. And mm-hmm. I had uh, then went to several Abersold camps where I got to know him a little bit. And, you know, uh, fast track to 1980, uh, he was teaching at the University of Bridgeport and said, why don't you move here? And I'd always wanted to move to New York anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I went there, but at the audition for the jazz band and stuff, the other two drummers who had already been there a year or two were Joel Rosenblatt mm-hmm. and Dave Weckl. <laughs> Those two guys, right? Man. And, uh, yeah. And I mean, you know, nobody knew who they were yet. This is before. Right. Any they're of that. students. They're students, yeah. but they sound killing. Of I mean, course. you know. And here's little me from the farm in Topeka, <laughs> you know, had never really been anywhere, right. you know. And, you know, had just won this, you know, drum contest. And uh, I thought that I had some things to bring. Mm-hmm. thought that I was kind of okay. And that day pretty much was the, or the rude awakening. I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Have I wasted my life to this point? I mean, you know, right. <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I guess so. But that's why I'm here is to find out the truth and right. do something about it. Get your ass kicked. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. Just, the whole first year was about. Right. So so describe uh, the, the Ed Sof ass-kicking that you received. Well, one of them, the, the first one was, he was fantastic. Yeah. And uh, a huge influence on my playing and the way that I teach and, mm-hmm. and stuff. But, you know, he had me pick up the Ted Reed syncopation book. Mm-hmm. I, this is, I'm 18 years old. I'd never heard of the Ted Reed syncopation book. Right. And so I go get this thing and I'm looking through it and it's just what well, we all know, you know, eighth notes and 16th notes. And I'm thinking, he must think like, I don't, I can't do anything. Right. <laughs> I mean, of course, I had no idea that I'd spend the next two years in the syncopation book yeah. with all the different variations and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. He was amazing because he was always super supportive. Uh, you know, he's, he's got a, a great wit and, mm-hmm. uh, very intelligent man. Um, uh, we didn't really discuss, you know, the musical aspect as much as we discussed just the instrument itself. Hmm. You know what I mean? So we didn't talk about, you know, uh, Philly Joe compared to Elton Jones. Right. It was more, you know, technique. And I think that that was probably good for me because I had a lot of, had developed a lot of bad habits. Hmm. In some ways, I had to completely start from scratch. Right. And, and he was the best cat that I could have hooked up with. Yeah, just, he, yeah. He has that reputation of just being a master technician and, and being able to sort of, you know, recognize the, the flaws or the, the weirdnesses in, in people's technique and, and fix it, not, not in a uniform way, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he kind of, you know, e- everything is a custom job. He fixes your technique for right. you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. What were some of those bad habits, and, and, and how did he address them with you? Um, some of the bad habits that I had technically that Ed had helped me address was being dependent on one limb. Like, for instance, you know, the hi-hat always has to be on two and four. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, that's, the, that's all it does. 
And I could do some things with my other three limbs as long as my hi-hat was there. But if I took the hi-hat out or if I moved it around, everything fell apart. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't truly independent. Mm -hmm. It was dependent on one limb doing a certain thing. So he he helped me a lot in those areas. But the guy that really uh, helped me a ton was Joe Morello. Mm -hmm. Joe uh, showed me how to uh, use more of a rebound technique. Because up to that point, everything I was doing was by force and strength. Mm-hmm. And of course, being 19, 20 years old, you can do that without much, you know, you're, it's fine. Right. Okay. That, does, that doesn't last forever. Right. You know what I mean? right. So now it, it's total rebound. And it took me a long time. I really had to start over in, in a lot of ways, you know, even with basic rudiments, rolls and paradiddles and stuff, you know, really trying to, to get the idea of rebound and which leads me to there's a great uh, video on YouTube by the drummer Gordy Knutson mm-hmm. from Minneapolis yeah. and he apparently studied with Joe I think at one point but he has a little four or five part series each, each little segment is maybe four or five minutes long that completely describes the rebound and, and an ergonomic way of playing mm-hmm. how your wrist thing and fingers work you know and it's it's amazing so like I have my students watch the, that little series and mm-hmm. I also have them watch Victor Wooten's TED talk on the language of music mm. because I think both of those are really Victor's talk no matter what you play if you're in music at all this is a video you should check out right. and it's 15 minutes long it'll change your life wow. you know it, as far as like how you look at music and, and kind of you know the the way to be in it mm-hmm. and spread it along yeah. but Gordy's video talks about the rebound thing that that I struggled with so much with Joe and eventually have come to uh, uh, use a lot but I still check in with it it's right. basically like bouncing a ball off the ground mm-hmm. instead of forcing the ball down to the ground and then picking it up again which right. is how I play the drums right you know but it helps your sound it mm-hmm. makes your uh, better bigger sound uh, uh, stamina technique everything I think it just improves it so those would be two examples of how those guys made such a big difference for me. Yeah, it helps make a big difference. Yeah. So you went from you went from college to New York City. Well, while I was in college, um, you know, I went to college to be uh, close to New York. I didn't go to college to go to college. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of my ticket out of the Midwest, and and that's what I used it for. So right. halfway through the third semester uh, at, of you. University of Bridgeport. I was working a good amount, and that's when I joined Mary McPartland's trio. Right. And, so, and each semester, I had changed my major. Like I went there as a jazz studies, and I was like, well, "That's kind of ridiculous." How about music education? And after my first violin lesson, I'm like, "Nah, this isn't it either." <laughs> then I changed it to business law, thinking that that might help my career, and and that was like. I just couldn't take it. Right. This is like Robert De Niro in Casino, and like one year he's the food and beverage director, and the next year he's the entertainment director. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> just so he can stay there. <laughs> right. So the school thing, it was good. Uh, you know, I met a lot of a lot of guys there, some very good friends who I'm still in touch with, uh, some of them today. Mm-hmm. But um, I moved there to, to go to New York. So when I started working with Marion, I kind of f- figured, you know, I think this is my graduation. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'm going to to throw any more money away on something that I'm not doing anything with, which is going to school. Right. Because every night I was going to New York City. You know, I'd go to the Vanguard and hear hear a Mel or just go wherever. Right. And, until everything was closed. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, by the time and my friend and I, uh, my very good friend Danny Myers, who still lives in New York, uh, he usually drove. You know, because he had the car and I was right. still eighteen. Yeah. But. Uh, We'd get back as the sun was coming up. And I, wow. I'll never forget one theory class I had was at 7 in the morning or something like that. We got back about 6.30. And I thought, well, you know, I'll just go over there and wait in the, in the classroom. Well, yeah. I went to the classroom. I was the first one there, of course. Put my head down on the desk, and I woke up at 1.30 in the afternoon. And there had been four other classes in that room besides uh-huh. the theory class. I slept through all of them. <laughs> and so... <laughs> <laughs> So there's a little note on the board saying, you know, Mr. Strait, when you wake up, come see me. Oh, my God. That's when I thought, I don't, I'm just throwing my money away. Here. Right. I'm not doing anybody any good. Joining Marion McPartland's trio was kind of, was that your entree into kind of New York full-time? Uh, 
At that point, yeah. 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 And how did that we come had, about? Well, the way it happened was uh, we had done some little outdoor festival, I think it was in Stanford, Connecticut, uh, late that summer. Mm-hmm. And our little trio was uh, playing right before Marion McPartland's trio. So, you know, she came up from New York and her bassist, Michael Moore, incredible bassist, uh, also came up from New York. And the drummer, whoever it was, missed the train. Wow. So she had heard us, you know, before. And I knew who she was because I used to listen to her uh, piano show every Saturday morning, mm-hmm. either right before or right after Dick Wright's uh, uh, 10 a.m. Saturday morning. Yeah. yeah. Jack- from Lawrence, Kansas. And this is, goes back to the 70s, you know, yeah. pre zach <laughs> <laughs> So I knew who she was, you know, and she said, oh, would you like to, would you like to play with us? Our drummer isn't here. And I was like, well, yeah, I'd love to. And, and I was totally relaxed about it, didn't really care because I thought, you know, I'm just feeling this is a little thing, you know, I'm just right. going to have This a is time. a fluke. <laughs> you know, she, I mean, she, you know, she's just being nice. <laughs> and, uh, so it, it, I guess it went okay. And uh, yeah. a couple of weeks later, she called and said, hello, you know, this is Marion. I'd like to know if you could do a concert with me. And I said, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, and that's when I was starting. To, th- then I started to get a little nervous, like, oh my gosh, you know, really? Okay. So she gave me the address. I was just telling this story to somebody uh, at a camp last week, two weeks ago. She gave me the address and uh, said, just show up with the tux, and be there at the rehearsal, mm-hmm. and, the, you know, and then uh, that'll be it. So I get the address, and this is before MapQuest and all that stuff. So yeah. I have my little bus, you know, and it's in downtown New York City. And it turns out that it's at Lincoln Center. <laughs> so, yeah. So I go with my tux. And this is now, this, this gig is sometime, I think it's a late November, December, or something like that. It's winter. It's mm-hmm. cold. Yeah. You know? And, uh, I get there, it turns out it's in Lincoln Center. <clears throat> I find my way to the loading dock and unload my drums, <clears throat> uh, go to the hall where we're supposed to play and set up. And there's a string section, and it's part of the New York Philharmonic. <laughs> Every step of this day just got, you know. Right. And, and it was kind of funny because uh, by the time we started <clears throat> the gig, uh, I was so freaked out I didn't care. Mm-hmm. It was almost like the very first time I played with her, it was like, well, this is a this is a, you know this is a one off. This is it, you know. Right. And I relaxed and fine, and it went fine. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But I had forgotten, you know, as I'm as I'm getting going in there and just getting like you know blindsided with all this information. I left my car in the loading dock. Mm. Didn't even think about it. So we get done with the concert, and I go out, and of course it's gone. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, I had left my coat in it, so I've got my tux, and my drums on the curb, and it's. <laughs> <laughs> I had to call my friend. my friend Dennis Strun lived in uh, Spanish Harlem at the time. I said, Dennis, I'm in real trouble. You got to come help me out. And so he got in the cab and came down. And, and I spent the next two and a half days with him, you know, in his apartment trying to find my car. Oh, no. So they had ripped out the radio. And, oh, you know, God. Of course, the story was, well, that's how it was when we found it. I'm like, oh, yeah. Right. In the back of Lincoln Center, that's how it was found. Yeah. Of course. Anyway, it, it turned out to be a. It's pretty incredible four days. Yeah. But that long to get back home. It took me four days, you know, after finding the car. <laughs> right, right. And in New York, I mean, you're, you're just like, as the crow flies, you're a stone's throw from home. You right. Know? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> anyway, I, I just, I just kind of chuckle every time I think about that first experience. But from that point, I mean, you know, I played with her all the rest of the time I lived there until yeah. about 1989. And we did a little bit of travel, you know, like to Texas and Florida and upstate New York. Most of the work that I did with her was on the East Coast, you know, between New York and Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. She was just the best. Yeah. She's an incredible, incredible woman. Yeah. And so the, uh, your, your New York resume also uh, grew to include uh, Barney Kessel, Right. And, and uh, Woody Herman, correct? Yeah, Tal Farlow as well. And that was because the bassist, one of the bassists with Marion, his name is Gary Maserati, and he still lives in Jersey. Uh, he was working with both those guys. Mm. And so recommended that I, you know, join too. And so that's how that worked out. Yeah. Woody's thing came about because of uh, a recommendation from Ed Sof and John Riley, who I knew. Yeah. Uh, and they said, yeah, you know, would you be interested in doing that? And that was one of my dream gigs. Right. It's middle school. Because <laughs> I would 
band was also a big band that I had fantasies of, you know, sitting in with at some point. Yeah. And now here's this chance to do this, you know. And that was a blast. It, it was it was a short one. It was about three and a half months. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, started with him in L.A. Um, right after they recorded the 50th anniversary album. Mm-hmm. I was there concert to hear and that was Jim Rupp and Lynn Seaton in the rhythm section yeah uh, Williams the piano player who lives in Chicago but he's from Topeka and I knew him in high school mm-hmm. so this goes but uh, yeah I listened to that concert and we got on the bus and drove for three days to San Antonio Texas and that was the first gig wow and, yeah and that was that was a real learning experience and Woody was was well, I didn't get to know him really, but he was very nice to me, mm-hmm. and uh, the band was amazing. So. I'm sure, yeah. And when talk about talk about the learning experience, like how did that did did that gig force you to grow or change or or uh, you know because you're part of you're part of the Woody Herman drumming legacy is you know sterling and legendary, and uh, so in in being a part of that, did you did you feel pressure to play a certain way or? Did Woody put that on you, or no, no, no? Everybody was was real nice. The learning thing it was interesting because, in hindsight, uh, well, first of all, I could never play loud enough. <laughs> My volume just never was was never quite there, right. and I'm not a loud drummer. I've never have been, right. and I thought I could do it, and I just couldn't really do it. Mm-hmm. And Woody was like, "You need to get." bigger sticks you know and so i got bigger sticks that didn't help Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like i just don't play loud yeah uh so but i didn't feel any pressure to play a certain way um but i also in a way don't really count myself among those guys like jeff hamilton and ed sof and jake Mm hannah i mean they were like game changers with that band right and i was lucky to to play with them for a little while you know (laughs) That's that's how I see that, and you know I I do say that I played with Woody Herman because I did I was hired to do it and yeah. I was fired after one week and you know I made it for three and a half months but uh, the volume thing never really quite made it, <clears throat> um, and it was one of those things where even though it had been a dream of mine since middle school, once I got into that situation, it was nothing like what I thought it was going to be, hmm. and not really any any I don't have any negative you know, feelings about it, but it was just like, oh, okay, that's, that's what this is. Right. It's you just know? kind of regular, regular life, regular band. Yeah. And it, yeah, well, a great one. Great you know, band. Uh, yeah. 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 A great band, but uh, yeah, just as was a little different. I, I'm not sure what I was looking for. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you have these, you know, visions of this amazing situation. Yeah. You're not sure why it would be that way, but you're sure it is. And when right. you get there, it's like, yeah. I mean, it's great, but yeah, yeah. No, I, I know what you mean. Like you, you see, you see another guy's gig, or you see a band, or you imagine some gig, and like there's this sheen on it, and there's this kind of like Disney sparkle, <laughs> you know, in yeah. in your mind's eye, and then you you actually do it, and and it's it is great, but it it's still real life. It's still like it's not really that heightened reality that you kind of imagine. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would do it again, absolutely. Oh, I'm uh, sure, yeah. But you know, I they they were really super nice to me, and you know, Bill Byrne uh, was the the guy who was kind of the road manager, and at so that last couple of weeks, I was thinking, you know, I kind of have to find a way to tell them that I'm going to move on, mm-hmm. but I hate to do that because I don't want to let Ed down or John Riley down, or you know. I want to honor my commitments. So I'm starting yeah. to think about stuff. And then I get the knock on the door. It's Bill Bernie goes, listen, we, we need to make a change. Mm. And, and I thought, Oh, here it is. And I thought, what a relief. I don't have to, you know what I mean? Like right, right. You know, it was kind of, everybody was on the same page with it. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And he was beautiful. He said, you know, you can, he told me a story. He said, if you know, don't feel bad. Uh, Peter Erskine had also played with Woody's band at one point. Yeah. And he, he lasted a couple of weeks or a month or something. And uh, he said it wasn't because Peter isn't a great drummer. And obviously we know Peter's like one of the most amazing drummers, musicians who plays drums on the planet right now. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, he said it just wasn't the right situation for him. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And that was, that was a really beautiful thing for Bill to say to me. Yeah. yeah. And you can always say you play with Woody, but this, this is just, we need to make a change. Yeah. And, I, yeah. and you've, you, that's some class approach Mm -hmm. you know what I mean yeah yeah. what brought you uh, 
back to the Midwest from New York? That's kind of a long story, but we, uh, I had just gotten married and we um, were wanting to oh, start a family mm-hmm. and kind of, you know, get a plan together for the future. Yeah. So we couldn't really do that in New York. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, she was, was having a rough time finding a job and I could support myself, but not two. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we decided to come back for the, originally the intention was to stay just for a, a year and then move back to New York. Hmm. And then it didn't work out that way. And it's, <laughs> it didn't because the the nineties were amazing yeah. for me and all the the people I met and the things I got to do. Right. So right. that's why we moved back to the Midwest. So back to Kansas city in 1990, 89, 90, yeah. 89. Um, and from, from there, you hooked up with uh, two of the great vocalists of our time, Karin Allison and Kevin Mahogany. Yeah. So you, you were like, you, you came back to Kansas City like right as Karin was kind of like launching her career, correct? Yeah, well, you know, I, I unwittingly picked a great time to come back because Bob Bowman had just moved back from L.A. Mm-hmm. Danny M- had basically just moved back from L.A. Mm-hmm. Karin had just moved from, oh gosh, Minneapolis, I think, you okay, know, yeah, to yeah. Kansas City. Bill McLaughlin was there. You know, he was conducting the Kansas City Symphony. Uh, and then Kansas City at that time was was kind of like it seems like it is now. I mean, it was just having this explosion of interest in music and yeah. good music you know and so i mean it worked out to be just great uh, bob put together a group with danny embry rod fleeman and, my, and myself called mm-hmm. interstring and uh, so two guitars bass and drums mm-hmm. and uh from there you know we hooked up with paul smith kim park was there yeah. kevin was there you know and everybody was just kind of getting rolling so it didn't happen right away but with by the you know, by ninety two or ninety three, it was it was boiling. Yeah. Besides the cats that were already there, like Tommy Ruskin, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. Rust, um, Gerald Spates. Yeah, yeah. And for the for drummers listening, go check out Tommy Ruskin. Like Absolutely. Google Tommy Ruskin. Go onto YouTube. You will never see a more swinging drummer, <laughs> a more beautiful uh, brush player. Yeah. Just like when if if you want to think about Kansas City jazz and Kansas City swing, like. Just go watch Tommy Ruskin, and we I lost him unfortunately about a year ago. Something um, like that. But uh, I think there's still quite a bit of uh, uh, audio and video of him to be enjoyed. Yes, and and I think every Kansas City drummer who heard him was influenced by him. I, I think he's one of the most underrated drummers that I can think of. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was truly a world class player. Yeah, yeah musical, uh, intelligent. I saw him do a solo once. Where he, you know, was had a lot of showmanship too, mm-hmm. <clears throat> which he didn't really do much. You know? Yeah, but yeah. Not, and you know, like people like myself try to do that stuff, and it looks stupid. <laughs> it just, we're, I'm just, we're just not made for it. Right. But there's guys who can do that. Like Tommy could do it. Jeff Hamilton can do it mm-hmm. when he wants. And it comes off as classy, entertaining. You know what I mean? And it's got fun. A to it. and fun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. So, but Tommy could do that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So, um, how, how did like how did the trajectory of 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 Karin's career and your kind of uh, partnership with her uh, uh, develop in the in the nineties? Well, we started off just doing local stuff, and uh, uh, gosh, you know, we've played together for uh, I'm guessing twenty two or twenty three years. Yeah. You know, so it's been a long time, and. Uh, uh, I started traveling with Kevin first, about okay. 1994, and traveled with him all the way to 2000. Mm-hmm. And that was a lot of international travel. I mean, we were gone a good amount. But Karin was starting to travel more then, too, nationally and then internationally. So I was kind of doing both gigs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Kevin, well, I mean, five years is a good run with, with a band. So, you know, did five years with Kevin, and then that just kind of kind of stopped. Yeah. Not any reason except it just did, mm-hmm. and and you know we're still in touch and, and good friends. Mm-hmm. But uh, that seems to be when Karin's travel really picked up. Yeah, and I was also starting to travel with a young piano player named Eldar. Right, Eldar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was he was only what fifteen or sixteen years old then. Yeah, yeah. And we're starting to travel nationally, and then that turned into an international thing too. Mm-hmm. So I guess I could say from. 
Now, let's see. About 1994 <clears throat> until 2009, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I was in at least two bands full time, and it was pretty much all international travel. Wow. National, international travel. Yeah. yeah. All based out of Kansas City. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's where it started. And then Eldar eventually moved to, first he went to LA, then he moved to New York City, where he still is. Mm-hmm. Karin's in New York City, where she's been since 2004 or three or something. Yeah, right? yeah. And uh, Kevin's based in, uh, oh gosh, he's in Florida. Right. Yeah. So I uh, uh, interviewed Ryan Lee a couple, uh, couple weeks ago for the for the podcast. And one of the things we talked about was um, how, you know, musicians like him and Herman Mahari um, have launched like these international careers without leaving Kansas City. Right. Um, and, and I told him one of the reasons I left Kansas City was because I felt it was kind of landlocked and it was hard to kind of get out to the rest of the world from there. Um, he's, of course, proven me wrong, but something I'm realizing now was, is that you all had proven me wrong before I even got there. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure what I missed (laughs) during, during my time in Kansas city, but, uh, you know, you spent time in New York and, and Mm -hmm. still managed to, um, travel and perform internationally with, with your base in Kansas city. So Mm -hmm. What's what's your advice to to drummers and musicians who are in those second and third tier cities uh, about how to still get out to the rest of the world? Well, I mean, with you know, like what we're doing right now over Skype, mm-hmm. you know, the internet thing is uh, it's not so new to to you and and generations younger. It's mm-hmm. always been there, but you know, for someone like me of my generation, you know, this is a a whole brand new thing. And, and Brian, man, I, what an amazing musician he is. Mm-hmm. You know, Ann Herman and Peter Schlam. Yeah. You know, there's, I could start naming names and I'd be leaving people out. But right. suffice it to say, I mean, this music is in really good hands. Yeah. You know, absolutely. And yourself included. Oh, thank so, you. Um, but, you know, that's, that's a huge thing. You know, YouTube and, uh, you know, all the podcasts, mm-hmm. you know, just being aware and hooking up, snarky puppy, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the way that they've approached it, you know. Yeah. So I that's, that's the kind of, that's the legwork that we talk about, uh, you know, in, in this day and age, but like, what, what was the legwork that you had to do in the 90s and that Karen and Kevin had to do to, to bust out of Kansas City? Not that it, you know, is a prison, but, <laughs> you right, know, to... Right. Well, I think what they had to do, uh, I'll, I'll start with them and then... And, and, uh, say what what I th- did, but uh, what they think I think they had to do was they had to contact people. They had to have a recording to be sent. I mean, it's it's an amazing amount of work, mm-hmm. which I know that you're aware of. But you know, I got to see up close with uh, a little bit with Eldar, certainly with Karin, and a little bit with Kevin. You know how much time every day it takes <clears throat> to plan ahead to build you know, this structure and stay in touch and not only think forward, but also keep track of those who are supposed to be working for you or in your best interest. You got to, you can't just trust that they're going to do it. Right. You got to constantly monitor. I mean, ah, it's <laughs> like, oh, this is, you have no time to practice. Getting a headache already, man. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, you know, but if you, if you put the time in and you get it going and you set it up, I don't, I think you can eventually you know, the momentum starts to, to carry it, but yeah. it's a, it's a lot of work at the, in the first, first few years. And, you know, really Ryan and Herman would be the cats to, to address this more than me. Yeah. When, when I was in high school, everything I heard <clears throat> was that if you want to, you know, uh, uh, have a career doing this, you need to go someplace where there's a lot of musicians, basically meaning New York city. Mm-hmm. And that was the only way. Right. You know what I mean? So that's what I did. Yeah. And I'm sure there were other ways, but that's what I heard and that's what I came to believe and that's the route that I, I chose. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of ways to the same to the to the goal. Yeah. And yeah. Mine was, was more uh footwork and actually moving. I think Karn and Kevin's uh were more, you know, phone calls and, and connections and constantly, constantly working all the time to to make this happen. And yeah. then now not that people aren't working that hard now, but you know, they're uh, different, uh, different tools. Yeah. Prior to playing with uh, Karin and Kevin, how much experience had you had playing behind singers? None. 
<laughs> hardly any. Yeah. So, yeah. So what kind of an adjustment was that? Well, it was cool because it took me back to what I heard in third grade in a mm-hmm. way, you know, and uh, I mean, Kevin and Karin, I, I just think are great singers. You Absolutely. Know? They're, they're vocalists. They, they have an instrument in their throat. Yes. You know? Just yes. like we have instruments and uh, I've got one behind me. Yeah. So, but that's their instrument. And when you're, when you're working with someone like that, and especially those two people, because they're both very outgoing, you know, people, uh, it's, it's not a drag, mm-hmm. you know, kind of the a popular view when, when I was younger was like, oh my God, you know, we, we have a singer, <laughs> what a drag, you know, well, you know, I've been lucky to, to play with, uh, some truly amazing vocalists and mm-hmm. those are two for sure. Um, Kevin <clears throat> taught me, uh, through playing with him that, uh, you don't need to hold back hmm. with singers and certainly not with him. I mean, yeah. he, Wants, he wants you to put it all out there. Yeah. And you can, because he can take it. Right, right. He'll, he'll jump right in the ring with you. You know yeah. what I mean? And uh, make you sweat. <laughs> so, I love that. And Karen, uh, she can do that too, but, uh, you know, she deals with such nuance and subtlety. Yeah. That uh, I became aware of those aspects of the drums. Mm-hmm. working with her and at the same time I was getting to know Jeff Hamilton who was a master at that right and, you know I was listening to him a lot mm-hmm. I've really only taken one drum lesson with him but he's probably one of my biggest influences as far as a teacher because of all the hours of, that I've listened to him I really think closely a You're, lot of drummers say that like they you know they met him a couple times or they took a lesson or two you know but but his influence is is so much more uh, far reaching than that the guy's incredible. Yeah. He's yeah. great. So you talk about uh, subtlety in, in Karin's singing, and, and there's you know obviously a lot of subtlety in her singing, but there's also tons of subtlety in her arrangements. Um, <laughs> and, like, you know, I, I, I think of her uh, in the same, you know, similar category as, as uh, like a Tierney Sutton, where the, the arrangement itself is, is kind of, an aspect. It's not just the playing. It's not just the words and the melody or whatever. Like the arrangement is kind of this little world that the band right. creates for that for that song. Right. So so how how did you or how do you approach those those really specific subtle arrangements? Well, I think really good leaders, whether it's th- these two that we're speaking of, or uh, you know others like even Miles Davis, mm-hmm. you know someone like that. I think the best leaders allow their players or you know team to bring parts of themselves to the the finished you know products yeah. and you can tell someone what to do how to do it and exactly what you want that's one way you know but mm-hmm. you know with Karen and Kevin too and Eldar as well uh, it, for me um, it was like yeah what do you think do what you want to, you know and if they don't like it they'll tell you but mm-hmm. most of the time if you're really sincere and bring something that you feel has integrity to and that will help the music then they're going to like it because that's the best thing you can bring as a part of yourself yeah the most honest deepest thing so you know in that situation if it's the right situation you know uh, uh that's to how those arrangements come about. Yeah. Everybody brought what they truly thought was the best thing for it, mm-hmm. given everybody else involved. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. It is, you know? it is. It's, and, and I remember um, uh, years ago, I wrote an article for uh, Percussive Notes for the Percussive Art Society about playing drums behind a jazz singer. And, and you were the one, of, one of the people that I interviewed for that and kind of you know, uh, consulted about that. And I remember you, you said, uh, you, you know, the drums and the voice are the two oldest instruments on the planet. They and, are. and there's there's like a special, really deep connection between those two things. So um, just I- expand on that a little bit, and like the you know the the special connection between the the drums and the voice, and between you and Karin, and and how those two things are are kind of connected. We talked about this uh, that long time ago <clears throat> on the previous one, where you can see if if like the vocalist is relaxed, mm-hmm. just being aware of the body language. And, yeah. and, but they're, they may give you intentional signals, but there's a lot of unintentional physical signals right. that you can pick up on. It's just what they do yeah. and how they express things physically. 
Yeah. I mean, you can just, it's funny, interesting to sit at like at lunch hour downtown and watch people walk. Mm -hmm. You can, you can kind of get a sense of what their day is like just by watching them walk about 10 steps. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Is this in a hurry? Is this person bummed? Is this person not working? Or, you know, right. is, you know I mean, you can tell a lot, yeah. you know, about that. And so that kind of paying attention to the physical part is, is really huge. And, yeah. I, and I still try to do that with primarily with vocalists. It's a little more difficult for me with instrumentalists. But, me too. But with vocalists, it's pretty easy because they are, they are so naked in singing. Yeah. It is, it's the most, wow, the scariest thing. Right. You know, I mean, that's you. Right, you know? right. So there's, if you're really going to put that out there and be that honest and open, uh, other honest and open things are going to be happening at the same time. When I was in Kansas City, I got to record uh, a few times with Ron Ubel at, yeah. at Soundtrack. And um, he talked to me about you. As a matter of fact, at, at Soundtrack Studios in Kansas City, the drum booth had a little sign over it that said Todd's Room. <laughs> That's you had, right. You had made so many records there. That was, that was just your room. Um, <laughs> but I, like, I noticed that sign. I was like, oh, that's cool. I dig that. And he started talking about you. He was like, whenever I had Todd in here to make a record, all I had to do was put mics on the drums and and he put he put four like he put eight fingers in front of him and he just said I just like you know uh, as if there were faders in front of uh -huh. him and he said I just had to go and turn everything up he said there was <laughs> there was no mixing necessary there was no EQ like Todd just mixed and EQ'd himself as he played um, so I I want to talk to you about you know the the process of of recording jazz drums and and making jazz records because your discography is a mile long um and and the process of making a jazz record is is very different from the process of of other types of records. Um so just talk about your your approach uh musically and technically in the studio. It's well you know, my approach there is is pretty much exactly the same as on a live gig. Mm. So, you know, uh, if I mean Ron was first of all was great to work with, and I mean that was a situation where, you know, unlike Woody's band, that was a situation where it was a really good match. Mm. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. it just we I lucked out with with Ron and and Grant mm -hmm. too. Uh, but um, I just push it the same way, and just you know, if they ask me what how do you want your drums, Mike? They say that's your job. However you think is going to be best, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Only thing that I I don't well, the one thing I insist on is like, you know, I'd never take the front head off the bass drum. Right. You know, no one's going to cut a hole in the front of my bass drum. <laughs> you know, like none of that stuff. If they want the mic in the bass drum, then I'll bring a different bass drum and yeah, and I'll approach it more like, a, okay, I have to go to work now. But as far as like recording the jazz record, you know, uh, same as a live gig, I'm trying to pay attention to subtle subtleties. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm trying to, you know, be a team player and support everybody and interact as much as I can, mm -hmm. you know, with everybody, you know, uh, and, uh, and also, uh, be focused on the intent of the song mm -hmm. or, or the tune, yeah. you know, and, uh, try to keep all those things in mind. And I don't think about being in the studio. Hmm. Like I don't, I don't approach it as this is different than the concert we're going to do tomorrow or the one we did last night right. or or the gig at, you know, at the restaurant that I'm going to do later. Mm -hmm. you know, I had one thing that's actually, I think, helped me stay in love with this, with my job all this time is uh, I'm really good at tuning the audience out. Mm. And so no matter what situation it is, I can, I can focus my concentration just on the people on the stage. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's all I care about. That's my whole world during that hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Like, everything else is somebody else's deal. You know right, what I mean? Right. And if it's a leader, then, you know, the leader is, it takes a certain kind of person to be a leader <clears throat> and connect with the audience and the band. Right. And, and be that bridge between the two. Right. I'm not one of those people. Mm -hmm. right? I'm a team player. Put me, in, you know, back in the pack somewhere. I'm, I'm really happy. I don't <laughs> want to front center and, and talking to people. You know, I'm like, that's somebody else's thing. Right. So I just pay attention to people on the, on the stage, people in the studio, mm -hmm. and just musicians in the studio, you know, and yeah. 
that's how I approach it. So it was no different than anything else. And what, what Ron said about how like you, you mix yourself <laughs> on the drums uh-huh. really stuck with me. And, and it, it got me thinking about, I mean, it, that has to do with technique and volume and tuning and instrument choice, uh, right. you know, instrumentation. Um, is, is that, is that something that you had to hone over time? Was that a, a lesson from Soph? Was, is, how did, how did you kind of formulate this self mixing, uh, skill? Yeah. Well, you know, I think definitely I'll credit Ed Soph with, with helping me, uh, uh, have the tools to do that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I'll, I listened a lot to Peter Erskine uh, for a while, like in mm-hmm. the early 80s. And the way he orchestrated his parts in every band I heard, yeah, you know, really struck me like, wow, you know, he could have played that cymbal during this solo, but he chose this one instead. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, what? And so I started to just dissect it and analyze it like we all do. You know, yeah. why does that sound so good? You know, or why when i do this why doesn't it sound so good? You know? right right and, wh- and so or start- why does it come off in this particular way like how does it contribute emotionally to the music you know yeah yeah so the tuning you know uh, of the drums but the cymbals for me are, are the huge thing mm-hmm. and uh i mean i've got a, a several families of cymbals mm-hmm. you know I've got a lot of cymbals and i need a lot more so <laughs> <laughs> it never ends <laughs> it never ends i don't ever want it to end yeah, yeah. but you know, I've got I've got several family, families of cymbals, and I've got a couple of them that are, work well for big bands. I've got a, a family of cymbals that I use or used with Eldar, mm-hmm. one with Kevin, another family that I use with Karin. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, they're the cymbals that I found uh, contribute the most to the music that I know we're going to be doing, and mm-hmm. to their voices and their their approaches to the music. Yeah. The, oh. the symbols voices or, or uh, the artist voices and the artist voices yeah. yeah I try to match that to them hmm. to the best of my ability yeah yeah as far as the, the drum tuning I, I don't I'm probably more of a cymbal guy than a drum guy yeah but as far as drums go I like I like very clear you know uh, attack mm-hmm. but tone yeah you know and I also kind of tend to, to tune them lower yeah, you know, at the high higher pitch thing, right? Um, I just don't hear it, and it's, it makes it very hard for me to play really high pitched drums. Me too. the The yeah. longer the longer I've been playing, the lower my drums are getting. Yeah. Uh, in 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 college, I had them cranked up like you know, like uh, you know that Elvin stuff, um, and I just as time has gone by, that like the lower they get, the better I feel. <laughs> <laughs> you know. The, the the lower I get, the more I like the sound of of my own playing. Because um, I would, you know, I would just try shit, and and for whatever reason, on the on the really high tuning, I just hated the way I sounded. Um, yeah, I uh, but anyway, uh, I'm I'm gonna put you on the spot for a second and and ask you, like you talked about matching, you know, cymbal tone to the the artist you're playing. Can you can you give me an example of of like something you heard in in Karin singing or Kevin singing? And and said I'm gonna I'm gonna put that with this symbol for that reason. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with Karin, I started using a flat top mm. uh, on some of the recordings, mm-hmm. and also uh, using. Well, I was lucky again in the sense that that's when I hooked up with uh, through Jeff Hamilton, uh, hooked up with Michael Vosbein, mm-hmm. and started endorsing Bosphorus symbols, which are extraordinary, and then the Crescents, which are even you know more amazing. Right. And uh, so I've got. Uh, a fair number of those, but those really super thin cymbals have so many overtones, and depending on where on the cymbal you hit it, and you know this, yeah. you know it brings out a whole new orchestra. Right. I mean, it, it's like a symphony in there. Yeah, you know what yeah I mean? totally. And so, <clears throat> with through Karin, like I actually started finding regions of a couple of my cymbals that actually work better at certain points. Hmm. And it has to be pretty quiet or it has mm-hmm. to be mic'd for that stuff to come out. Like an outdoor festival, it doesn't matter. Right. You know, but smaller clubs or, or a studio for sure, mm-hmm. those things definitely come out. Yeah. And it's just, I don't know who hears it or if anybody really does, but uh, I think some people notice that it's different. Yes. They're not sure why. R- exactly. I was going to say, like, the, uh, the average audience member is probably not going to, you know, realize it. Like, oh, he hit that certain spot on that symbol. Right. And it, it made it sound this way. They just kind of, they, they perceive a, a shift 
in the music or, you know, kind of a matching of mood or energy. And like you said, they're not, they, they can't put their finger on it. They don't know what exactly it was, but they're like, ah, something, I, I heard that something happened there. Right. And, right. And it affects them. Yeah, ex- absolutely. Yeah. So with Karen, I, I found a couple of symbols that, that really I just used with her. Mm-hmm. That's, that's it, you yeah. know, and, uh, <clears throat> I could probably use them in other situations, but they work so well there. I just that's they're basically her symbols, right? You know, and I've got one that's like that. Uh, you should make her carry them. You should just make her <laughs> hang on to them. <laughs> I've got one like that for Eldar too. He and I don't play that much together anymore. Maybe once a year, once every year and a half, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but uh, I've got one like that for him as well. Yeah, and it's basically his symbol, right? I'm just holding on to it. <laughs> So for the past, uh, I don't know, decade or so, you've, you've had kind of dual citizenship between uh, Kansas City and, and Portland. Yes. Um, so talk about, uh, talk about what led you to Portland and, and how you've been sort of balancing between the two. Well, Portland was a decision <clears throat> that uh, my wife and I made. Uh, she's from Hawaii. Mm-hmm. So it was a halfway point. And uh, we talked about moving to the Northwest, getting out of the Midwest, you know, just because of, uh, you know, temperatures in the summer. And, mm-hmm. and temperatures so, in the winter. In the winter, yeah. And it's a beautiful area. Uh, we've been here since 2002 mm-hmm. or 2003, something like that. And, uh, you know, the uh, musicians here uh, are just phenomenal, mm-hmm. world-class musicians, some, some incredible drummers in this yeah. town. Yeah, I know Gary Hobbs is there, right? Gary Hobbs, yep. Gary Hobbs is in Vancouver, Washington, which is basically a suburb of Portland. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, but uh, Gary, there's a another younger drummer named Reinhardt Meltz hmm. who uh, has been playing with Gino Vanelli the last several years. Mm-hmm. Actually, G- Gino's whole band is from Portland. Wow. Uh, Greg Goebel, amazing keyboardist, is is with them. Uh, Damian Erskine, who yeah, is yeah, yeah. Gino's uh, nephew, right, is with them. Uh, but Reinhardt, man, is one of these guys. I mean, he does impossible things. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's something. You know what I mean? Like, anyway. The, yeah. No, I, I know exactly what you mean. You see one of those guys, and you're just like, "What? Uh, come on, man!" <laughs> I know. Like, because some some players you see, and you're like, "Wow, that was amazing!" I like, I wonder if I can do that. How did he? That was beautiful. And then there's other drummers. You're like, "God damn it! Just what? come on." <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> well, that's well, that's Reinhardt. <laughs> but Gary's here. Uh, uh, oh, I could, I could keep listing names. Uh, Ron Steen is here. He's yeah. a drummer. If you if you ever saw Animal House, yeah, the movie, yeah, they're at the toga party and they go, you know, uh, everybody goes down, get lower to the lo- floor, right? A little and bit softer now, right, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Ron Steen. He's wow. the drum. <clears throat> anyway. But he played with Joe Henderson for a while mm-hmm. uh, as well. And uh, swinging, he's kind of like a Tommy Ruskin. Mel Brown is here. And Mel's son, Chris, is uh, uh, kind of the, the young guy in yeah. town. So, yeah. I mean, it's just chock full of great drummers uh, and uh, just musicians all over the place. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of, the, one of the recurring themes on the podcast is, is the balance between you know, family and, and work life. And your your move to Portland was, you know, obviously family oriented because uh, uh, your wife wanted to be closer to Hawaii. Um, do you how do you how have you sort of balanced family and and work over the years? Well, it's it's not easy, and you know I think I've been successful in some ways and and not successful in others. But uh, I think one of the things that makes a big difference is um, your partner. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, uh, it's just, it can be very challenging. And in my case, for, for many of those years, I was gone so much yeah. traveling. Uh, I don't know if I would do that again, mm-hmm. but uh, it's been done and, and we're okay. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, everybody finds, finds their own way. It's, it's very difficult to do that. Right. So. Right. You know. But you, I mean, you mentioned your partner, your, your wife is obviously, you know, on board with, with what you, what you want to do for a living and who you are. Uh, and, 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 you know, my, my wife went through a similar thing. She had to kind of really think about if she wanted to sign up for, uh, the challenges that come with sharing life with a, with a musician. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, that helped, uh, with, 
excuse me, at least with my daughter, um, was when she was young, I took her to a lot of the festivals. Mm-hmm. So, and because we would play in the afternoon and have the evening off. And so if it was a two or three day trip or something and we had afternoon festivals, I'd take her. And there was one I did with Eldar in California where while, while, I, while we were playing, Dr. Lonnie Smith sat with my daughter. Oh, wow. You know, because I knew him from when I was in New York. I played with him for a couple of years. So, right. She got to hang out with him a little bit, and then we heard his set, and uh, you know, and for her at the time, being five or six years old or whatever, you know, the pinnacle of of a great vacation was to be in a hotel, order room service, and watch a movie. <laughs> hey, man, that comes with the gig. Yeah, <laughs> man. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so she got to go. I took her to Minneapolis and California and New York, and you know. Uh, not a lot, but but enough, and yeah. just got to see what travel was like a little bit, and we had a great time. Yeah. It's a great way to bond. And I I don't I don't have kids, but I I think that's one of the cool things about about musicians having a family life is is that when when you have a parent who's a musician, you you get to see uh, somebody like really walk in the walk in terms of of pursuing their dreams and and uh, making making something happen that they that they really want instead of. Um, you know, just letting it fall by the wayside and and going into a quote unquote normal job, um, right. they they see that if uh, you know if they want to do something you know unconventional, they 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 really can do it. Right. What are exactly? You, what are your kids into? Uh, let's see. Well, my oldest uh, boy, uh, he's twenty six. Um, he is a vocalist, but not a mm-hmm. jazz vocalist. He's mm-hmm. uh, been doing. Uh, some subbing with the Kansas City Corral mm-hmm. and uh, you know different things around Kansas City. He's actually moving to North Carolina here in about a month. Oh, where in so, North Carolina? Asheville. Oh, that's a cool town, man. That's yeah, that's right here. Yeah. So he's you know he's he's ready to get out, step out, and see what else there is out there. And I think this is a good move for him. So. Nice. And my next uh, son, uh, youngest son, is uh, into many things. He's uh, into computers. He's mm-hmm. built several laptops, and one of them my daughter still uses. He built it for about seven years ago. It's still she uses it for school, mm-hmm. and uh, but he gets way deep into many things. So he's into cars. Does a lot of major repairs on his own car, wow. which would terrify me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and but it's, he's fearless. And uh, th- this last year he's been into cooking. So he's been uh, kind of a almost like a sous chef in a uh, restaurant in Kansas City. Oh well, me and him got to hang out, man. Yeah. <laughs> what restaurant yeah. in Kansas City? It's called. Uh, Oh, great. Bellinopoly, which is on the Oh, yeah, Brookside. I know that place. Yeah. 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 Great Italian yeah. place. He's a great cook, man. Just really has got it now. So we'll see what he decides to do next. Yeah, yeah. And I would, I would imagine being a musician, you know, like <laughs> when, when, when you do what you do for a living, uh, you know, when your kids come to you and say, I want to do this thing, like all, all you can say is, yeah, go for it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's that's a great case with my daughter, uh, who just graduated high school. She's, you know, when she started looking into colleges about a year ago, she was just looking at local colleges. And I said, you know, don't, don't, uh, you know, sky's the limit at this point. I mean, look at all of these different schools. Look, you know, apply to Vassar. You know, look at New York City. What about some places in Europe? Yeah. You know, and she was like, oh, I don't know. I said, no, just, you know, the worst they can do is say no. Right. And so she actually did apply and she actually uh, got feedback from uh, several schools on the East Coast. And uh, as it turns out, she'll be going to McAllister, which is in Minneapolis. And that was one that was... Uh, you know, kind of off her radar at the beginning, mm-hmm. but uh, she looked at it, pursued it, has done what she needs to do to uh, apply, and they accepted her. And mm-hmm. uh, great package, which is good. You know, that's yeah. that a little bit helps. Right. So she'll be moving there in about a month. Wow. So she's she's off to Minneapolis. Yeah. Man, so you're going to be an empty nester soon. Yeah. Well, <laughs> then my youngest, he's he's going to be seven this fall. Oh, so not not very soon then. <laughs> no, no. And it's funny because you know I never intended on retiring because I love what I do. Yeah. And which is good because I can't retire now anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily, I picked a, I picked a good job to to do for the rest of my life. Right. I will be doing it. You know. All right. Thanks so much, Todd. All right, buddy. We'll catch you soon. My thanks to Todd for that great interview, and it should be noted that Todd deserves some special thanks because we were about three quarters of the way through that interview when Skype decided to stop working. Uh, We had to schedule another session a few hours later to finish it up, and this ended up taking more of Todd's day than he bargained for, so my thanks to him for hanging in there. 
Thanks to Sakai Drums. Check out their website and also check out the interviews we've done with Sakai artists. We've had uh, Eddie Bayers and Jamie Tate recently, and a little further back, we had Trey Gray and a two-parter with Ben Caesar. Thanks to my partner, Matt Kraus, for interviewing me on last week's episode. That was very cool of him, and I had a great time. Hope I can return the favor soon. Thanks also to Mike Jackson for his technical assistance, and thanks as always to you for posting on social media, leaving us ratings and reviews, and of course, for downloading and listening. <laughs>